today we are going to start a continue our discussion on estimators and specifically we are going to talk about maximum likelihood estimator So we have talked about estimator for mean, we have talked about estimator for variance, we have talked about uh, the fact that median of a bunch of random variables is an unbiased estimator of the mean. Uh, we also talked about the fact that there are uh, unbiased estimator for variance and then biased estimator for variance. So we know a lot about uh, estimators of individual quantities. Now, we want to generalize that concept a little bit in today's class. We want to think about, uh, so remember why we were worried about mean and covariance? It's because uh, for Gaussian, we know that the mean and covariance actually gives you the entire distribution itself. Because Gaussian distribution, the PDF, probability density function, actually depends only on the mean and the covariance matrix. So, it seems to me that many a times, I mean, it doesn't seem to me, but many a times what happens is the probability density function or the probability distribution actually depends on some parameters and those parameters is, are things that we do not know. And so we want to estimate those parameters. So mean and covariance is just two of those parameters. You could have many other cases. So for instance, in the Bernoulli's, Bernoulli random variable, it's parameterized by P, which is the probability of getting a 1. Um, and 1 minus P is the probability of getting 0. So Bernoulli random variable is uh, characterized by, the distribution is characterized by one parameter P. In the case of uh, geometric, also it's characterized by P. Exponential, characterized by lambda, Gaussian, characterized by mu and covariance sigma. What other distribution did we talk about? Wishart. Uh, I think the distribution was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think the parameter was sigma again. Any other distribution that we talked about? What are the parameters that influences the PDF or the probability mass function? So as you can see, in many of these cases, there are certain parameters, and those parameters is what we want to compute based on the data that we have available. So I'm looking at the sensor data from the thermostat, and I'm measuring the temperature, and I assume that the temperature is Gaussian distributed according to a Gaussian distribution with covariance sigma. Now I want to estimate what the mean mu and the covariance sigma is. Uh, if I go to Panera Bread and I'm looking at people coming in pan to Panera Bread's counter and ordering stuff, that's most likely the inter-arrival time is distributed according to exponential distribution. So I look at the time T1, the customer comes and then orders something. And then I look at time T2 and I'm interested in T2 minus T1, so inter-arrival time of two customers. So I look at T2 and then I'm noting down T2 minus T1 in my notebook. So one customer comes after T2 minus T1 time. Then the second customer comes at T3 minus T2 time step. Like those are the, that's the inter-arrival time between customer two and customer three. So I'm noting down in my notebook all of these inter-arrival time. And I know from my past experience that those inter-arrival time is distributed according to uh, exponential distribution with the parameter lambda. But I don't know what lambda is. I don't know what the inter-arrival time distribution is. I know that, I know the form of the distribution. I don't know what the parameters of those distributions are uh, for that specific case. So that's what we want to estimate. So all in all, I'm going to use theta to denote the parameter of interest. And basically the distribution, the PDF, will be F, X, depends on theta, or the PMF will be P theta of X.
So theta is the parameter of interest and my PDF depends on theta or my PMF depends on theta and it's a function of x. <clears throat> and depending on the situation, depending on the application, depending on the context, you may know some parameters, but you may not know other parameters. So in the case of Gaussian, you may know mu, but you don't know sigma or you may know sigma, but you don't know mu, right? So whatever parameter is unknown, you're looking at the data and you want to estimate that particular parameter. So here is the problem. I'm observing x1 all the way up to xn. I want to find theta. How would you go about solving this problem? <clears throat> what should we do? So let's assume x1, x2, x3, all of these are geometric distribution, but I don't know what the value of p is. So p is my parameter of interest. I don't know what the value is. I want to find it out. So I observe x1 to xn. I have n observations in my data set. I want to find the value of theta. What should I do? What do you think is a reasonable way to figure out what theta should be? Any thoughts? Let's look at it, okay? So let's say, let's look at the joint distribution. So what is P of X1 to Xn? Uh, these are IID observations, by the way. What is this probability equal to? Well, in the case of PDF, it will be product of i equals 1 to n f theta xi. In the case of PMF, So if x is discrete, then this is what your joint distribution is going to look like. If x is continuous, this is what the joint distribution is going to look like. I'm not using the correct notation here, so pardon my notation here. But I think it's very clear from the context what exactly I want to find out. So this is the PDF, the joint PDF of x1 to xn. This is the joint PMF of x1 to xn, given that theta is the parameter that we want to find out. So that's the joint distribution. I have that observation. So this observation is x1, this observation is xn. Do you come up, can you come up with a way to find out the value of theta? So here is one option that we can pick. We can say that theta hat, I'm going to define it as arg max of this product f theta xi. And this is theta in whatever set, rn or r or rn cross n, whatever that set is, this is how I'm going to find out the value of theta hat. I should also put an n here because I'm using n samples to compute theta hat n. Or I can use the same expression 
but now I am using the PMF. So what I am trying to do is given the observations, given the observations I have made so far, I am actually going to plug in the observation in the joint distribution and compute the value of theta that maximizes the joint distribution at that particular observation. So here I am maximizing the joint probability density function, here I am maximizing the joint uh, probability mass function, evaluated only at x i, only at the observations that I have made. So remember x1 to xn is my observation. Okay, so I've made these observations. I'm going to compute what the distribution was. And because I've made these observations, it's quite likely that that observation was the, was the highest likelihood uh, observation that I've made. And therefore the theta would correspond to the best possible joint distribution that I can get uh, so that I can maximize the probability of observing that particular set of variables that I've observed. Okay, so this is known as a maximum likelihood estimator. So this is the likelihood function. I am maximizing the likelihood function and I'm getting an estimator for theta and that's why it's called the maximum likelihood estimator, MLE. So this is a general recipe. So when we talked about mean and covariance, we didn't talk about what could be a general recipe for computing uh, parameters that are of interest. So this is one way to compute the parameters of interest. And so let's look at an, a concrete example to understand the nuances and differences between maximum likelihood estimator and some other estimator that you might just come up with on your own. Okay, so let's say x1 to xn uniform zero theta. What's the mean? So uniform distribution is uh, the f theta of x 1 over theta for x between 0 and theta and then 0 else otherwise. Right? So all of you remember the discussion about uniform. So that's what my uniform distribution is. What is the mean value? What is the mean here? Anyone remembers the mean for uniform? theta over 2. So I don't know what theta is. Okay, Theta is the parameter of interest. I don't know what theta is, but I'm observing x1 to xn. Can someone tell me a good estimator for theta? Can you come up with an estimator for theta? We don't have to worry about maximum likelihood estimator. Just try to come up with an estimator for theta. knowing well that theta is equal to 2 mu. You have an estimator in mind? So theta is equal to 2 times the mean. How can you estimate theta? So let's think about it. What if I come up with an estimator for mu, multiply that estimator by two, and I get an estimator for theta. What's an estimator for mu? 
just the regular average. So I'm going to have the first estimator as two times summation of xi over n. i goes from 1 to n. Is that a good estimator? Is that a reasonable estimator? So I've estimated the mean, and then I multiplied it by 2, because I know this from my background about uniform distribution. What is expected value of theta hat 1? Can someone tell me what the expected value of theta hat 1 is? Let's try to compute it. Uh, I'll compute it here, but then I'm, I'm going to erase it. So expected value of theta hat 1 is 2 over n. Expected value of summation of xi, i goes from 1 to n. This is 2 over n times n times theta over 2. I get theta. Because expected value of xi is theta over 2, right? Expected value of xi is the mean mu, theta over 2. And then there are n such summations. So I have n theta over 2. And so I get expected value of theta hat 1 is equal to theta. Is that a biased estimator or unbiased estimator? What do we mean by a biased estimator? So whatever estimator I came up with, if I take the expected value, and the expected value is the parameter itself, then it's an unbiased estimator. This is unbiased. Biased estimator means that expected value of theta hat 1 would be different from what the actual value, the intended value is. Okay, so this is an unbiased estimator that we have come up with for theta. So let me note it down here. Expected value of theta 1 hat is equal to theta. Any question so far? Now let's try to find the value of theta using the maximum likelihood estimator. So I have to multiply all these functions. So let's do that. Theta 2 hat, or let me write it as MLE, maximum likelihood estimator based theta hat. It is arg max over all theta in R. I'm going to assume that theta is strictly positive, by the way. So argmax theta in zero infinity of product of one over theta raised to n, no, one over theta, i goes from 1 to n. But there is a bit of a problem here. So the problem is, the problem is I don't know what values of, uh, I don't know the value of theta itself. Okay, so I need to write it carefully. So this is for x1 less than equal to theta, xn less than equal to theta. 
and then zero otherwise. Because remember, x has to be between zero and theta, and it has to be zero otherwise. So this is what my my likelihood function looks like. So I'm going to erase this product because the product is the same. So I'm going to erase this and I'm going to write one over theta raised to n. Can someone tell me what the argmax is going to look like? Just think about it for a couple of minutes and try to figure out at what point between zero to infinity is this function going to get maximized uh, when these are your readings, x1 to xn are your readings. So if theta increases, as theta increases, this, this function is actually going to go down. So we want this theta value to be as small as possible so that all of these constraints are satisfied, right? Because if I increase the value of theta, then this term is going to become smaller and smaller. So what that means is my theta hat MLE is max of x1 to xn. Because that's what, so if I pick the max of x1 to xn, so these are my readings. This is what I'm observing. I take the max of all my observations. I know that these constraints would be satisfied for all n. And I pick the maximum value of the value of theta so that this particular function is maximized. That's my MLE estimator. This estimator and this estimator looks quite different. Do you see that? This one is max of x1 to xn, this one is two times the average of x i. So technically MLE estimator may be different and this estimator by the way is not biased. So expected value of theta hat MLE is not equal to theta. So this is an unbiased estimator. It's complicated to figure out what the expected value of max of random variables is. It's, it's, you, it's doable. You can find it out by doing the computation by hand, but it's quite cumbersome to do the computation. So we are not doing it in the class, but many probability books will have this computation in one of the chapters. <clears throat> so basically, uh, you can come up with an unbiased estimator or you can come up with a biased estimator depending on, sorry, I, did I write unbiased? No, this is a biased estimator. This one is unbiased. So whenever you are faced with an estimation problem where you need to figure out some parameter of interest based on the observations that you are making, you can either pull out an estimator out of your hat and, or you can use the maximum likelihood estimation procedure to come up with a different estimator for the same quantity. And both of them are valid answers. There is no good answer, but some of them could be unbiased, some of them could be biased estimator. Just something to keep in mind. Any questions on this chapter or this whole conversation on estimator? Um, because I, I want to change the topic and I want to talk about hypothesis testing now which is the next topic. No? Okay.
Okay, so we all have hypothesis in our life. And the question is, do we want to test based on our observation whether that hypothesis is true or false? Okay, so I'm looking for a good example of hypothesis testing. So let's consider the following hypothesis testing. So I came to Columbus for the first time ever in my life. And I know there are a bunch of grocery stores all over Columbus. There is Kroger, there is Giant Eagle, there is Whole Foods, there is, I don't know, some other market and so on and so forth. And I'm a graduate student and I want to figure out which grocery store should I shop from every week so that my, um, uh, so that my uh, total grocery bills are minimized, whatever. Which one is the best grocery store for my specific consumption pattern? Now, you might come up with a hypothesis that I think Kroger is the best place for me to shop from. Okay, that's a hypothesis. The alternate would be Kroger is not the best place for, for you to shop from. And the question is, now we need to do this hypothesis testing. Okay, we need to figure out if Kroger is the best place for you or not the best place for you to shop from. How, you, how would you go about doing that hypothesis testing? How would you figure it out if Kroger is really the best place for you or not to shop from? Any thoughts? What did you guys do when you first came to Columbus? Anybody here from Columbus itself who has lived all their life in Columbus? Okay. <laughs> so your parents did that probably for you. <laughs> They told you go to Kroger and you probably did not think about it. But people who came to Columbus for the first time, how did you figure out what's the best grocery place for you is? Proximity. Proximity. Okay. So proximity was the main motivator for your situation. Anybody else? Same? Okay. So every week you went to the store, you bought stuff. So you observed X1, X2, X3, which is maybe your grocery bill. X1 is how much bill you paid in the first week. X2 is second week, third week, and so on. But then you don't know whether Kroger is the best place for you or not. All you figured out is what's your bill in Kroger is like. And is it different, different grocery store? Okay, so in week one, you went to Kroger. In week two, you went to a different grocery store. In week three, you went to Kroger again. Week four, you went to a different grocery store. So you try to cycle through various grocery stores and then over a long period of time you kind of figure out, you get a hang of, okay, these are the things that are best in this particular grocery store and these are the things that's better off bought from outside. So these kind of topics are studied under the umbrella of hypothesis testing. So you come up with a hypothesis, you get a series of observation and then you figure out whether that hypothesis is true or the hypothesis is not true. Oh, so, so what's the theoretical framework to understand this? So there are four things we need to do. We need to define null hypothesis. And this is denoted by x0. Then you want to find alternate hypothesis. This is H A or H1. Depending on which book you pick, it would be written as H A or H1. And then there is a test statistics. This is your W of Zn equals to Hn of x1 to xn, which is your observation, and then the rejection region. Which is a set. Uh, what should I call it? Let me call it RR. But it's basically a subset of Rn or maybe an maybe r
okay <clears throat> let's come up with a concrete problem and go back to our favorite example so my null hypothesis h not is that the average temperature of dl 264 which is this room is 71 degrees fahrenheit that's my null hypothesis my alternate hypothesis is average temperature of dl461 is greater than 71 degrees fahrenheit How do I test which one of them is correct? Yes. Uh, take yeah, so I have measurements from the last 10 days. Okay, so that's, that's my x1 to x, I don't know, 10,000. In each day we'll, have, we'll make a thousand measurement. So I have like x1 to x 10,000, I've observed it. So n here is equal to 10,000. Now what do I do? What should I do now? So I have 10,000 readings of the temperature of this room. What should I do now? Take the minimum? Mean, okay. So let me uh, compute Zn to be summation of xi over n. I goes from 1 to n. Let's say for the sake of argument that the temperature, that Zn turns out to be 71.001 degrees Fahrenheit. Which of the two hypotheses is correct? HA. HA. Can you straight away reject H0 if this is what you observe? Should you reject H0 or should you keep H0? That's the question. You keep so are you going to reject HA? Right, so we need to define the rejection region. Okay, so let's, let's do the following. Let's say my rejection region is 71.5 comma infinity. So if Zn, if Zn is in rejection region, then this implies HA is true. If Zn is not in rejection region, then H0 is true. So I've picked the rejection region 71.5 to infinity and because in this case Zn is in rejection region, is, sorry, is not in rejection region, I'm going to accept that H0 is true. Now this, this number is arbitrary. You know, you can pick what this number is, but what happens when you pick different number? What happens if I pick this to be 71 versus 71.5 versus 75? What would change? So I picked 71.5, maybe you will pick 71, maybe somebody else will pick 72, and so on and so forth. What is going to change based on our individual preferences of what this rejection region should be? The outcome would be different, right? Uh, hypothesis still remains the same. We have only two hypotheses here, but whatever we accept or we reject is going to change. Would the reality also change? No. So the reality, there is some reality. There is something, there is some reality and according to the reality, either H0 is true or HA is true. Okay? But based on the observations we have made and based on the rejection region that we have picked, the way I interpret the reality and the way you would interpret the reality would be quite different. So I might accept that H0 is true 
But you might say HA is true because of the way you have defined your ejection region. So that brings me to two types of error that happens in hypothesis tests. So let's talk about the two errors. Type 1 error. which is H0 is rejected but H0 is true. So the reality is H0 but in fact based on the observations and rejection region you have rejected H0. You have, you have said that HA is true and then type 2 error where H not is accepted but H A is true. So the reality doesn't change. Reality is immaterial of whatever observations you are making, whatever test statistic you have defined, whatever this function HN is. So here HN is the simple averaging, but you can define very complicated HN also. You can take median for instance, okay? So you want to be fancy, you can take median, you can take mode, you can take geometric median, you can, you can define this function HN in any way possible. I might have a different HN than your HN for the same set of hypothesis. So each of us pick our test statistic, each of us pick our rejection region. The reality doesn't change. So we incur either a type one error or a type two error. So the reality is something, but maybe I'm going to reject H0, or maybe the reality is HA, but I'm going to accept H0, and I'm going to say that H0 is true. Now based on the fact that all of these are random variables, there is a probability of type 1 error and the probability of type 2 error. So how, what's the chance, what is the chance that I'm going to make a type 1 error based on the HN and RR that I have picked? Or what are the chances that I'm going to make a type 2 error based on the same set of variables? So that is given by alpha and beta, alpha N and beta N. So alpha n is the probability of type 1 error and beta n is probability of type 2 error. And if you think about it, and people have thought about it for hundreds of years now, if you plot alpha n and beta n, you will get a curve that looks like this. This is for n equals to 10. This is for n equals to 100. This is n equals to 1000 and so on. So this is the best alpha n and beta n you can get by picking an appropriate hn and rr. Okay, so that would be the best estimator ever, right? You can pick, uh, you will actually get this trade-off curve. So when you have high alpha n, you, will, you can have a smaller beta n. When you have a high beta n, you can have a smaller alpha n, but you can't have both alpha n and beta n to be small. It's just impossible. However, what you can do is you can wait for more observations or you can wait for more observations and you can jointly decrease alpha n and beta n, right? But you always have a trade-off curve and you always have to figure out where on the trade-off curve you want to lie, okay? So let's think about it in the context of medicine. I came up with a drug and I tell you that, okay, you have a headache, you can take this drug, it's going to cure your headache. Okay, whatever, something like that. So my H0 is, my null hypothesis is 
that whatever drug I am giving you is going to cure your headache. The alternate hypothesis is it's not going to cure your headache. Okay, binary answer, yes or no. Now, what I can do is I can give this drug to 10 patients, 10 people, and I can see whether their headache was cured or not cured. Okay, and on that basis, I'm going to come up with some estimator, some test statistics, some rejection region, and I'm going to pick H0 or HA. And I'm going to incur a probability of type 1 error and a probability of type 2 error. So type 1 error is H0 is true, but H0 is rejected. Type 2 error is HA is true, but H0 is accepted. So let's think about it in the context of drugs. So remember, H0 is that the drug works. HA is that the drug doesn't work. Uh, which error do you want to control? Which error should be small? So let's think about it. So this error says that the drug treats the disease. Drug treats the headache. But I am going to say, based on my test, that the drug doesn't treat the headache. That's one option. Type 2 error is, drug doesn't treat headache. But based on my study, I say that the drug treats the headache. Which one of, its, which one of these two is bad, and therefore should be controlled very tightly? Type 2. Type 2 should be controlled tightly. What about you? Yeah. So in medical sciences, you want this to be the case. You want to, you want to make sure that the type 2 error is as small as possible. Uh, so how do, you, how do you reduce the value of type 2 error? So you want your beta n to be as small as possible. So you want your beta n to be somewhere here. right? So probability of type 2 error should be very small. Uh, but that's going to require n equals to 1,000 or maybe n equals to 10,000 samples. I cannot be giving drugs to 10,000 people before I actually conclusively say that, okay, this drug is going to work or not work. So what do I do? We have a, a whole bunch of drugs. How did they come up with the fact that this drug is good or bad? How do you get more N? Any ideas? You know, people do animal testing, right? So they first create cancer in a mouse, and then they administer the drug, and they see whether the cancer is uh, going away or not. Okay? So by in the, the way they increase the value of N, and the way they get they control beta N, is by actually testing it on different animals first before they actually test it on humans. And then even when they are testing it on human, there is a whole bunch of paperwork that needs to be done before you can actually test it on someone. Um, I'll give you a very specific example. Uh, so do, does any of you know what is the deadliest disease in the world? Like if you catch that disease, you are bound to die. Anyone knows? Rabies. Have you heard of rabies? So if, uh, if an animal bites you, like a wild animal bites you, you might catch rabies. If you get rabies, you are 100% going to die. Well, now that probability is 99.99%, but at some point of time it was 100%. Okay, so the H0 was, you get rabies, you are going to die. Now, turns out that there is a girl in California who got rabies and she was admitted to the hospital. And there was some experimental stuff that uh, the doctor had in mind. And so they got all the approval. And because that girl was, uh, like because of, the, because of the historical thing, like we knew that with rabies, people generally die, not generally, but people always die. Um, they got the approval to administer that whole treatment plan for that particular girl, and that girl happened to survive at some point of time. I mean, after two, three months of uh, intense uh, treatment. So that was the first time when it turns out that HA is true, but technically H0 was accepted in the sense that you could treat rabies, 
but people had generally accepted that rabies is untreatable. But eventually, you know, they rejected H0, and, and of course now, uh, I think there are two people in the world who have been treated from rabies, and of course there are many others who die every year of rabies, but two people are known currently who have actually been cured of rabies uh, in the past history of mankind. So anyways, uh, how does that relate to cyber attack? or cyber security. When we are coming up with detection algorithm, I'm making observation. I have a detection algorithm. I come up with a number and I pass it through the rejection region and I check if the number satisfies is in the rejection region or outside of the rejection region and then I raise the alarm. And when I raise the alarm, two things can happen. Either there is a cyber attack, but I do not detect it, or there is no cyber attack, but I detect it. Okay? Two things can happen. And so you always want to come up with an algorithm which you need to figure out what is the best trade-off. If you're driving a vehicle on the road, on the highway, and you detect there is an attack, but you do not detect it, is that bad or good? really bad. Your car is sitting in garage, there is some cyber attack happening, you don't detect it. Is that good or bad? Doesn't matter, the car is static. It's not going to hurt anyone. So really depends on the situation. And based on the situation, you would have a specific test statistic and a specific rejection region in order to control your type 1 error or type 2 error. Okay. So what we are going to do in the next class is we are going to look at some simple examples of H0 and HA, what the test statistic is, what the rejection region is. Uh, just, as, just out of uh, uh, practice, like we will figure some of these things out. Uh, we might talk about alpha n and beta n, but most likely we won't be because many a times these expressions are extremely difficult to compute. What generally happens in practice is you come up with a test statistic, you come up with a rejection region, and you try to run some simulations or run some actual experiments on the real system because it's not human system, you can really run the experiment. Uh, I, how, how many of you are aware of Center for Automotive Research? So you know, they have an experimental facility for vehicles also, like you can literally run the vehicles on this uh, test bench um, and then you can uh, test a lot, of, uh, a lot of stuff about the vehicles, like you can attack the vehicle and you can check whether the vehicle is going to do something unintentional or not. So you can test all of that because they have that test bed available. Uh, so you, what you generally do is you come up with these test statistics, you do either a hardware in the loop simulation or you do software in the loop simulation, then you implement it on actual hardware and you test it on the field. Uh, there is a very big testing ground about 40 miles from here called TRC, Transportation Research Center. So they take the vehicle with the hardware, with the test statistic, with the rejection region. They put it on the uh, TRC, uh, their, their uh, lot, the testing area, and then they test whether this attack or whether this problem is going to create an issue for the vehicle or not. Okay, so that's how they test it in reality and then if it is acceptable, they are fine with it, they put it in production. If it is not acceptable, they go back to the drawing board, come up with a better HN and come up with a better rejection region in order to uh, improve the overall performance and get the correct trade-off between alpha N and beta N. So that's all I wanted to discuss today. We'll uh, talk about different test statistics and rejection region in the next class and then uh, we'll get into the attack detection algorithms. So hypothesis testing is important because typically our null hypothesis will be attack is happening and our alternate hypothesis will be attack is not happening. And we need to come up with HN and RR to figure out H0 is true or HA is true. So thank you and I'll see you on, today is Wednesday, right? I'll see you on Friday.